Fantastic. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Medicine Grand Rounds here on, uh, at the University of Louisville. And we are pleased this morning to have a discussion of organ donation in the modern era by our own Dr. Glenn Franklin, who is professor of surgery uh, here at the university. And to introduce him, I'm going to introduce our uh, division chief for general medicine, and that's Clayton Smith. Clayton uh, has been here quite a while. He has been a, uh, a Tulane Green Wave for undergrad and a Miami Hurricane for, uh, for medical school before he came and did his uh, residency in internal medicine here at uh, UL, and he's worked his way up to the leadership, and we're very proud to have him be on our leadership team. And uh, Dr. Smith, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. On behalf of the Division of General Internal Medicine, Palliative Medicine, Medical Education, it's my pleasure to welcome today's Grand Round speaker, Dr. Glenn Franklin. He has been at U of L since 1998 when he joined the department as a trauma and critical care fellow after having completed his general surgery training at the University of South Carolina. He attained the academic rank of professor with tenure in 2012 and has been a prolific scholar during his time on faculty. In addition to conducting research on obesity and nutrition, he has a particular interest in optimizing organ donation management. He has served on the boards of various societies in the organ donation world at the local, regional, regional, and national level, and is an expert in the field. Today, he'll share his expertise in his talk, Organ Donation in the Modern Era. Everyone, please help me welcome Dr. Franklin. Thanks, Lawrence. Well, thanks a lot for asking me. And uh, it is fun to see old friends. And I do mean old. Uh, <laughs> some of us have known each other for a while. I think McClave's known me since I was a medical student. And uh, uh, Sadlow and I were just uh, reminiscing about when we first met. Here's Mark Pfeiffer in the back. Mark has known me since I was a medical student. And here I am. And you guys are all still alive, too. So. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, as, as all my senior people keep either passing away or retiring in our department, I look to my left, I look to my right, and I realize, wait a minute, I am the senior trauma surgeon. <laughs> That's a, uh, it, it's an epiphany when it happens, but uh, I'm still having fun. And so, uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about organ donation. So, I usually start with some quotes and who better to quote in this, you know, Lent season than, you know, St. John. There are two verses in the Bible where John writes about that there's uh, no greater love than to lay down your life uh, for a brother. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he wasn't talking about organ donation, but it is, uh, it is an interesting uh, concept because it is a gift. And we're going to talk about uh, the gift a lot today. When I was here as a medical student, one of the first things I heard Dr. Polk say during M&M, and he has said this many times, is the highest compliment that a family can pay you after the loss of a loved one is to grant you permission for an autopsy or organ donation. Now, that's a very interesting statement to make, but Hiram then followed that up by saying that means they either are willing to give something or let you learn something after something bad has happened. And I think Hiram really set the tone in the university hospital, the old general hospital, to be very pro-donation at a time when hospitals, it was kind of an afterthought. And he's always been this way. Um, why be this way? Well, every 10 minutes, somebody's added to the waiting list. And on average, 22 people die every day waiting for a transplant. And one donor can save eight lives with solid organ. Uh, tr transplantation, not to mention 50 plus other people who can benefit from tissue uh, donation or eye donation, which can enhance the, their, their lifestyles. So in our business, in my business, there are donors everywhere. And the faster you go, the bigger the mess. Uh, and so this is something that's, you know, somewhat pervasive in the trauma field. We see a lot of uh, these folks, but so do you guys. Uh, with regards to people who arrive anoxic for one reason or another, people who die from cardiac arrest, from 
neurologic complications. They're not just gunshot wounds to the head like they used to be in the old days. There are a lot of ways to leave this world. So we're going to use the back to the future uh, mantra today, and we're going to talk just a little bit uh, about the basics of organ donation, which I'm really, I think, have pitched at your residence, and I hope there's a bunch of them online. Um, and so there's really a couple types of donors. When we talk about standard criteria donors or extended criteria, which is kind of an old term, but it just gives you the flavor that they're older donors that have health issues. And those people die by brain death. Okay, so we've got brain dead donors. And then we have the other type, which is donation after cardiac death. In the old, old terminology, that used to be called the non-heart beating donor. And before 1985, that's how everyone was a donor because the definition of brain death had not been truly legalized in our country. We didn't have a legal definition for brain death. So everyone who was a donor before that time period was a donor by, you know, the so-called non-heart beating or now donation after cardiac death. And now, you know, they put a new fancy term to it, which just drives me crazy, which is donation after the termination of circulatory death. Uh, meaning when you think, that the, the pump isn't circulating blood anymore, even if there is a heartbeat, uh, the patient is dead. So in other words, people who have electrical activity, PEA, they're not circulating. I mean, you can declare them dead. I think it's kind of crazy and confusing. It's donation after cardiac death. And then there are living donors, which can be related. You gave a kidney to your brother, your father, your aunt, and non-related. There can be non-related living donors. We're not going to talk anything about living donors today because CODA is not really involved in that mission. So this concept of brain death has been around for a long time. In the late 1800s, this guy, uh, Horsley, Victor Horsley, uh, published in the Quarterly Medical Journal. Look at this quote, which I just think is fascinating for late 1800s. Patients often die from respiratory and not cardiac failure. The heart continues to beat, and such was the end of all cases of pathologic cranial tension, meaning intracranial hypertension, brain swelling. 1800s, they recognized that the brain could swell, people would die, the heart would continue to beat. Uh, so I thought that was fairly interesting. In Kentucky in 1986, we passed KRS 446.400 which is the brain death law in Kentucky. This is that law. It's been uh, updated a few times with some language, but these are the basics, which basically say that when respiration and circulation are not artificially maintained and there's an irreversible cessation of spontaneous respiration and circulation, or when they are artificially maintained and there's irreversible cessation of brain function determined by two licensed physicians, uh, that you can declare someone brain dead. That's all it says. So me and McClay could decide that Sadlow is brain dead right now. He could challenge us, but we could sign his death certificate because that's what it says. <laughs> and so uh, it, it's pretty simple. Uh, now, it's a little more complicated when you talk about hospital protocol and about declaring someone brain dead for organ donation. So that gets a little bit more in the weeds, and that's what we're going to talk about for just a few minutes. So a clinical exam by a physician when they suspect that someone may be brain dead. No cortical function, no brainstem function. They're apneic by loss of brainstem reflexes. That exam is confirmed by a second physician. There then has to be some sort of confirmation testing, either the classic apnea test, which we'll talk about, a nuclear flow study, which is way more common. In our hospital, we allow CTA or MRA, transcranial Dopplers and brain stem evoked potentials. The problems with those tests are, number one, we don't do them very often for brain death studies. Number two, Transcranial Dopplers require the one technician in the hospital we have who can come upstairs and do them. And there's a 
you know, the, the ideal way to do this would be to have a transcranial Doppler exam on the patient when they arrived that showed they had flow and then something happens to them and then they don't have flow. Uh, that's not usually how this goes. Usually when people, you know, think they want to use this modality, they just get the one test that shows no flow. You have to remember with any ultrasound or Doppler technology, there are people who don't have a good acoustic window. Or maybe they have no flow because you just don't have the technical ability to find it. So there is that little wiggle room there. And then evoke potentials. One technician in neuro that does it. One doctor that reads them. And so you have some limitations there in, in using those tests. EEG, no longer used. The Harvard criteria for all of us old enough to remember that, no longer used. People do not use that. I see it done all the time, but it is not considered an effective modality. MRI, nope. CT scan that shows a devastating brain injury and herniation, that's great. But that's not a confirmatory test to brain death because it doesn't measure neurologic function in any way. So the apnea test, you got to be warm. You got to be not hyped up on a whole lot of narcotics or, you know, drugs that are going to suppress respiration. You need to be hemodynamically stable. If you're not hemodynamically stable and we pull you off the ventilator and you don't breathe, guess what's going to happen? You're going to become hemodynamically unstable, which is bad for being an organ donor. <laughs> So, you know, there's a few people that fall into this category, and this is what we ask physicians to say to families about all of this. I suspect, therefore, I need to confirm, all right? So you're warming the family up to what you're doing and why you're doing it. And in our hospital, it's policy for CODA to be present for the apnea test. That's A, to protect the physicians that they do it correctly, and B, to protect CODA that it was done correctly. Since I've been medical director, we've had a couple of instances where apnea tests were done incorrectly. They declared the patient brain dead, and then I get a nuclear flow test, and they have flow. So they're clearly not brain dead. So it, it, is, it is not a test that people do all the time. It's comforting, I think, to have, quote, experts around who can help and, uh, and notice if there are any problems. Now, you're allowed to give them oxygen. So a lot of people will stick a red rubber down the ET tube. Some people will just cut a nasal cannula and stick it there. Some people will work up a little T-piece kind of uh, uh, apparatus. You don't want to occlude the endotracheal tube, but you're allowed to give them oxygen. You're just not allowed to give them a breath. And then you need to see that rise in their PC, uh, PCO2 greater than 60 or a movement greater than 20 over baseline for our people who may be retainers. Uh, remember. What is baseline? Because all these people are on the ventilator and most of our ICU colleagues are probably blowing them down to in the 40s anyway, but that may not be their baseline. So there's, you know, some clinical judgment that's needed to determine what's the baseline for the patient so that when you stop ventilation and they get the rise of 20, is it 20 over 40? Is it 20 over 50? because their baseline may have been in the 50s, a lot of our COPD years. So you can see where this test has some subjectivity to it that has to be some thought placed, all right? The nuclear flow test, not so much. You either have flow or you don't, period. Doesn't matter what temperature you are, it doesn't matter what drugs are on board, okay? The nuclear flow test in some ways is bulletproof. Uh, although it has its flaws as well, and you're looking for the, the empty calvarium sign. Some people will call it the donut sign. You can see there's no flow in this person's brain. I will tell you there are five nuclear agents out there, two that are expensive, three that are cheap, two that are hydrophobic, three that are hydrophilic. We use the expensive one because it's the best test, and that's what Mike Rice believes in. He's our nuclear uh, radiologist. Unfortunately. Guess what they use around the state? The $500 one that's cheap. And so sometimes I ask the CODA folks who are at the bedside to send me the flow study. And I had to have a crash course in this from Dr. Rice so I could look at them because what's sometimes read as the hot nose sign that people used to refer to as really flow in the base of the skull. And they didn't shoot an oblique view. You see we've got 
you know, uh, lateral views here, and then there are oblique views that should be obtained as well. So what isotope is used can, can affect this test. So when I say bulletproof, bulletproof's in when's the last time your technicians did this and when's the last time your radiologist read one of these things? Here, all the time. Glasgow, mm, not so much. So uh, there, is, there is some uh, uh, wiggle room here. So why do we worry about this stuff? Well, everybody's on drugs nowadays. Probably most of us are on some kind of drug or no, at least all of us old guys are. And uh, <laughs> not this drug, <laughs> but, you know, everybody's on something. Uh, and so there's been, you know, uh, guidelines for the American Academy of Neurology that, you know, when you do these tests, it should be in the absence of a significant CNS depressant drug. Now, does that mean if the nurses are giving someone a little Versed for comfort on the ventilator that it's a no-go? No, because nursing doses of Versed are not enough to flatline brainstem reflexes. Someone who was taking Xanax as a scheduled drug, you know, and was driving, doesn't have enough Xanax on board to flatten all brainstem reflexes. Somebody who took an overdose of Xanax might. So that's different. So, you know, we, we watch for the drugs and why be so careful? Because all the time there are reports of people waking up, you know, when they were declared an organ donor. Now I've reviewed every one of these cases and in every case, I believe the declaring physicians did not follow the rules. So this is a preventable problem, but it makes great headlines. I tell uh, people that this isn't going away. Heroin's on the rise. And I read an article, what, last week the headline was, Governor Brashear signs executive order regulating Delta. I was like, well, good God, I'm leaving on vacation tomorrow. And we're flying on Delta. What is Andy Brashear doing with Delta Airlines? I didn't read the next line because it went around. Delta 8. I'm like, well, what in the heck is Delta 8? Some thing called gas station heroin, which is an over-the-counter stimulant uh, that has opioid-like effects that the kids are all buying because it's over-the-counter. And so there's plenty of this stuff out there. And um, I tell all of our coordinators, you got to watch the bees, baclofen, benzodiazepines, and barbiturates. I personally have never seen a baclofen overdose, but two of those front page headlines were baclofen overdoses, and it will flatline somebody and mimic uh, brain death. It wouldn't have gotten past the nuclear flow test. They just happened to do an apnea test that probably wasn't well done. So if someone is got drugs on board, CODA insists on a nuclear flow test, and that's to protect everyone. You wouldn't believe how many people that pisses off around the state that are intensivists. It's unbelievable. They're enraged that I would ask for a nuclear flow test in an overdose patient, not, you know, giving no thought to the fact that they're the ones at risk if they declared somebody dead who wasn't. Uh, it's really interesting to me. I, I, I've never understood it. Our overdose data is going way up. It's gone up again since 2017. And there are over 100 synthetic drugs on the street that are not tested for by any of our tox screens. And so when in doubt, we wait. When in doubt, people call me. When in doubt, we try to get quantitative serum levels if we know the drug, like phenobarb or penobarb, which have really long half-lives. We try to wait out half-lives if we can. Nuclear flow testing is an absolute must. And if it's something none of us have ever heard of, I used to call George Bossy you know, because he ran the uh, the poison control center and try to get some information so that we are absolutely sure, you know, we're not declaring someone brain dead uh, that has a bunch of drugs on board. Now, this whole concept of decoupling actually started here in Louisville by Neil Garrison. He coined this term 40 years ago. And it's the concept that the family understands there is a devastating neurological diagnoses. They're then given the grave prognoses of brain death, and then there is some time period, and that time period varies 
for different families. People grieve at different rates. Uh, and then they're approached by a different individual. Neil noticed when he was the medical director of CODA back in the 80s, that when the physicians approached a family and there wasn't this time period for them to kind of understand and process the concept of brain death of their, their loved one, that we really only had about a 36% consent rate for donation in our hospital. When we decoupled that, that rate rose into the upper 60s. And that was way before CODA came up with this concept of family support liaisons, people who go and sit with the family. You know, the doctors aren't with them all the time. Even the nurses aren't with them all the time, more than us. But, you know, and they go sit with the family. They interact with the family. They are professionally trained grief counseling people who can talk with them about brain death help them process that information. Plus, they know who's on the registry and who isn't because they just go. And if you're on the registry, you're a consented donor because Kentucky, like almost every state, is a first-person consent state. You sign your driver's license, you're consented. Your family cannot reverse your wishes. That is a legal binding document that you made when you were of sound mind. So... Uh, in Kentucky, you you sign your license, you're a donor, and uh, we move forward because it's it's legal. That's what that's what the law says. So we ask that only CODA approach people. CMS actually has a regulation that says only specially trained people are allowed to approach. I'm not. I don't approach. You know. So only specially trained people, and in, in our area, it's it's our our folks from CODA. So. Uh, please don't do that. Let's just go back to the past for a little bit. That's sort of the basics of donation and look at transplantation. And um, you can see when the first renal and lung and liver transpl transplants were performed in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, so the 60s were like a great era for transplantation. I mean, that was the decade of, the, of transplant right there. And a lot of uh, things happened. The first six successful transplant ever from a live donor was in 1954 in Boston by Dr. Joe Murray. And he put a kidney in, from one identical twin to the other. And then you could see a picture of these two guys, you know, when they're in their 70s. So obviously it did a pretty good job. <laughs> it lasted a long time uh, because they were only 23 uh, when this occurred. And that was the first successful long-term transplantation from a live donor. And this was all before fancy schmancy immunosuppressive drugs. Obviously, they were DNA identical twins, uh, but um, uh, it, it, it was the first one. Now, in Kentucky, the first kidney was placed by Alan Lansing, uh, the old cardiac surgeon from Audubon Hospital and Dr. Belcher, who was one of the urologists. And Alan, and if you've ever watched Alan be interviewed or you ever knew Alan, he, he was pretty sure there wasn't anything he couldn't do. Uh, and so Alan thought, well, I sow little bitty blood vessels on the heart all the time. Surely to God, I can sow two blood vessels on this kidney, which are way bigger than the LAD. And Belcher's like, well, I can put a ureter back together. <laughs> How hard can this be? Now, they didn't have Google or YouTube, but I think they had probably looked at some pictures or diagrams from other people. And their resident was Dr. Mohammed Amin, who was our chief of urology for 30 years here at uh, U of L. And so it is very interesting how, you know, it all circles around. And that patient did very well. In 84, so literally 20 years after the first heart was transplanted in South Africa, you know, Layman Gray transplanted the first heart at Jewish Hospital. And in 1987, Dr. Garrison and Dr. Rick Bentley did the first kidney pancreas. And then three years later, they did the first liver in the state of Kentucky. So the first liver in Kentucky was done in 1990. So, I mean, I was in medical school. And so uh, it, it's really kind of amazing to think that it was not that long ago. That, that Kentucky really moved forward in, in this field. This is our donor service area for CODA. 
we could cover most of Kentucky and most of, uh, or I'm sorry, we cover almost all of Kentucky. There are a few counties in Northern Kentucky that coalesce with the Cincinnati OPO. We do have four counties in Southern Indiana, right around our place. And we have two counties in West Virginia. And uh, so we do have West Virginia donors. You gotta be savvy to they have different brain death laws in Indiana and West, uh, West Virginia. Not all states require two physicians. Kentucky requires two physicians, but so, uh, you, you know, where the donor dies is where they're, they have to be pronounced. So let's look at what's going on with donation data. So the need for organs continues, although the good news is, is in about the past four years, the waiting list appears to have peaked and flattened for the first time in 30 plus years. You can see that transplants are going up and donors are going up, but there's still a pretty good gap between the needs and the gets. There are 1,900 kids on the nationwide list. I was actually surprised it was that small. I just had in my mind it would be a lot larger, but I guess when you think of why would kids need transplants, it's almost always congenital anomalies or something. And so it's 1,900 and you can see the average wait time for organs can go anywhere you know, from weeks to months to years. You wait a long time for a kidney. Last year was the biggest year ever in the history of our country for organ donation. There were nearly 43,000 transplants performed uh, and over 25,000 of those were, were kidneys. There are all-time records for liver, heart, and, uh, and lung transplants in 2022. Once again, if you look who's on the waiting list, most people are waiting for a kidney. Uh, the next group is about 12,000 people waiting for a liver, and then you can uh, see it sort of uh, ticks on down uh, after that. If you look at our country and you look at the overall donations per 100 eligible deaths, you can see that Kentucky does pretty good in that regard. We're more over here to the, uh, to the purple. But when you look at organs transplanted per donor, uh, we're sort of square up in, in the middle here uh, and, uh, at around three. Um, I would argue that a lot of that is, is because of the health overall of our population. Um, Utah usually does pretty well in this regard because they're all very healthy and they don't drink and they don't do drugs and they don't smoke. Uh, uh, but we we don't do as well. We're like number two in obesity, sometimes number three, but we're number one in childhood obesity. So just wait for 10 years and we'll be number one in obesity. So we've had this increase over time in DCD donors. And I'll explain at the end why that has been, but we are being more aggressive going after the DCD donors. It's only so many people are going to die by brain death in your state. I mean, that just is what it is. Uh, we, we took the helmets off the motorcyclists 20 years ago and, you know, the speed limit went from 55 to 65 to 70 in some areas. And, you know, we have a seatbelt law, but we were late to get to that, but now all cars have airbags. So there's just only so many people that are going to die by brain death. So the DCD donor is, is really the next pool of donors that people are going to, uh, look to. So if you look at you know, that rise, this is in uh, the UK, and they've been doing this a little longer, I think, than we have. And then if you look at our country and you look at just the, the uh, is my little mouse thing working up there? Oh, no, it's not. All right. I don't know if this works or not. There we go. If you look at the US, you know, our percentage of DCD donors is increasing. But you can see there are certainly other countries that have a much larger increase in, in DCD than, than we do. And then if you look, that diagram on the left at the top by Beal, those are transplant centers and what kind of volume they do of DCD livers. And that's every transplant center in the country. And you can see there's more people on the right-hand side of that not doing very many than there are a handful of centers doing a whole lot on the left-hand side. And then if you look at the bottom right diagram, you know, you can see there is an increase in DCD liver transplants. But once again, 
that increase is in a handful of centers. They're riskier. There's a little higher risk of hepatic artery stenosis or a biliary stenosis when you do a DCD because the dying phase for those patients includes a warm ischemic time. And so people are reluctant. Our two transplant programs in Kentucky are extremely reluctant. And when I became, you know, the medical director at CODA, we had done five DCDs in the entire career lifehood of CODA. We did 75 last year. And so uh, our two programs here, are, are they're, they're a little risk averse because they're smaller programs. And I'll talk to you about the numerator and the denominator a little later. But any of you who do quality metrics for the hospital or for your own programs, understand the concept that uh, an observed to expected ratio, and if your observed is higher than expected, you could be in trouble with CMS. And so both of our programs are a little risk averse, so they don't do very many DCD livers unless they're perfect. COVID took a big hit on us for a few years, didn't it? I mean, in so many different ways. Um, but uh, it, it was at the very beginning an absolute rule out for organ donation. Now, that's not true anymore. It's a total maybe. Thoracic organs may still be considered in the COVID positive patient, although that was never ever true uh, in the first two years of, uh, of the pandemic. But we looked at CODA or at uh, COVID positive people all the time. This paper came out two years ago. This is from the University of Michigan. And uh, there was a donor to recipient transmission of COVID during lung transplantation. There was also a transmission of COVID to the surgeon and to two other people in the operating room. And this was someone who was COVID negative tested by the hospital. But as all of us know, what kind of tests have been used and the rapid and the PCR and the antigen antibody and, you know, your kid sneezed on my kid. They probably got COVID test, the mommy test. Um, you know, there's uh, there's been a lot of transition in this. So this was a single case report that changed the field like that. And so now every donor who's going to have thoracic organs uh, done has to have a bronchoscopy with a quantitative BAL culture that's run on PCR uh, because they think that is the most sensitive way to prove whether that donor has active COVID disease uh, or not, not a nasal swab like we do. So every donor that CODA approaches, you know, we're, we're doing a, a BAL and a, and a PCR on at our, well, actually, we're in, I always go like that because I'm over at the hospital, this building. <laughs> uh, we have, we, we, we use a reference lab here. We have another reference lab uh, in uh, Shepherdsville as well that, that provides us with, um, some COVID uh, testing for our potential lung donors based on one patient in that paper. Code has gotten better over the years. You can see that the blue bars are organs and the light blue bars are, are, uh, are donors and the, the green is DCDs. You could certainly see an exponential rise since 2017. Um, if you look at uh, the types of donors, again, once again, you can see the, the, the increase in the dark bars there of DCD donors. In 2021, we did 188 donors. In 2022, we did 240. And right now we're on pace to do about 280 this year. So, uh, and I mean, when Neil and I were both, you know, kind of co-managing the, the medical duties at CODA, when I first came on faculty and got involved, we were doing 100 a year, 105. So it's an exponential climb in 20 years. And the past five years have been all but just phenomenal. Um, this is U of L. Uh, we're doing more DCDs here. Uh, we had a, a few less donors last year, but more DCDs overall. Uh, and if you look at uh, U of L uh, donors and their quality, let me just go over here to this slide. It's a very complicated slide, but all you want to see is all these numbers except for one are greater than 100%. And that means that, you know, we're, we're doing above 100% of what's expected in organ yield, meaning that our donors, even though they're pretty darn sick people, the predictive calculator would say you should get 10 hearts and we're getting 12, you know. And so we're doing a little bit better uh, here, which uh, is good. 
So that's our uh, data for 2022 from CODA. I'm very proud of that. If you'd asked me 10 years ago, would we ever have 240 donors? I told you you were smoking something that those two M&M guys were uh, laying in. Uh, 75 DCD donors transplanted 605 organs, and then there were over another 100 that were uh, committed for research, meaning pancreata. Our ODE is 0.88, which is a little lower than it usually is, but that's because we're going after risky and riskier donors. And um, the calculator for ODE doesn't take into account uh, many things. Uh, like uh, if you congenitally have one kidney, it still thinks you have two. There's no way to put in the calculator that you were born with one kidney. <laughs> so you're one organ down all, right, you know, right off the bat. Uh, but we're usually right around one. Last year we were at 0.88. And I think it's because so many people are going after so many risky donors that transplant centers are, are much like buying a car online on eBay. They're just waiting for the best offer. And they'll tell us they want our kidneys. And then an hour before OR, somebody will offer them a better kidney and they'll back out. Uh, so in any case, that's, uh, uh, that's the state of, of affairs. I think we'll be close to 280 uh, this year. We've done a donor every day in March. Uh, our staff is uh, exhausted. We had to give them a mental health day where we canceled QA last week <laughs> and said we're not going to meet and have to present all of our errors to Dr. Franklin. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess that's a good problem to have uh, is, is that we're busy, just like our hospital. So let's talk a little bit about donor management. And thoracic organs are often the most difficult to, uh, to manage. They are the, the magic organs, uh, uh, so to speak, that we love to place uh, harder to get than uh, the abdominal ones. And it basically goes back to this uh, Da Vinci uh, painting of where God is creating uh, Eve from a rib of Adam. Therefore, God was the first thoracic surgeon. And uh, that tells you everything you need to know. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we do give steroids based on this paper in 98 that it increased lung procurement. So they all get a big bolus of steroids to reduce the inflammation in the lungs. We're doing all these crazy kind of ventilator protocols. This was the, the uh, pilot study with PEEP recruitment, and that improved uh, uh, alveolar recruitment, improved lung donation. I mean, I think that just makes sense to any of us who do ICU or pulmonary type medicine. But, you know, it was uh, it was kind of a landmark study that, that you should do these PEEP maneuvers on, on the donors. And then we try to follow the SALT protocol, the San Antonio Lung Transplant Protocol, which uh, includes uh, PEEP maneuvers and it, it increased uh, their lung donation rate by 25%. Uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, the Proceva trial was out in the New England Journal of Medicine about proning people. And the people who were proned did better than the people who were not uh, proned. And this must be true. It was in the New England Journal of Medicine. The only thing that could be more accurate than that would just be Google and WebMD. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think proning is, you know, generally accepted as a good strategy for ARDS. It's clearly not for the faint of heart. Our patients can be kind of big. Nurses don't like to do this. I don't blame them. Uh, when you look at back injuries amongst nurses and time off with workman's comp. Um, but we do, we, do, uh, we do prone our lung uh, donors if we are having some difficulties in uh, trying to improve uh, their pulmonary performance. Hormonal resuscitation has had a lot of incidental studies that have uh, may or may not be really true. There's a big multi-institutional trial going on right now involving T4. Uh, but the idea is to mitigate some of the post-inflammatory response. But there's a belief that there is, you know, hormonal, particularly thyroid depletion at the time of uh, brain death. And so you're replacing that hormone uh, at the time of brain death. Um, this article by Ali Salem back in, uh, 2007, you know, demonstrated that, you know, T4, uh, uh, was given in the, there was a higher organ transplanted per donor rate, 3.9 versus 3.2. Remember the magic number would be generally seven. 
organs per donor. And so 3.9 versus 3.2 doesn't sound like a lot, but I mean, that's nearly a whole organ. Uh, and if you spread that across a population, that's a lot more uh, organs uh, transplanted. This was a, a same group published a paper in the American Surgeon that I actually reviewed uh, as a, on the editorial board, and they were giving hormonal resuscitation before brain death was declared. And a lot of people questioned the ethics, you know, of that, including this guy who uh, said, no, wait a minute now, guys, you know, I understand you think they might become brain dead and might become donors, but what's your justification for just giving them all these drugs? And they quoted some articles about hormone depletion in the critically ill. And I think the intensivists of us know that that's uh, true. Um, and then they, uh, uh, they had a very interesting answer to one of my questions when they revised their article, which was they actually had a couple of patients who got better neurologically after they prophylactically gave them some hormonal resuscitation. So they said, in fact, it's good ICU care because somebody might get better. And so uh, we've started doing this uh, a little bit here on the trauma service. The, the neurosurgeons will do it. My colleagues will do it. I try to stay out of it because of my potential conflict of interest between you know wearing a trauma hat and being the, the uh, code of medical director. But they actually found that their organ transplanted per donor rate went way up if people before they were declared brain dead started getting the steroids and the T4, uh, which is very, uh, I think, very interesting. Not sure I understand all the mechanics of that. There may be a little bit of a Hawthorne effect that maybe they were paying attention and taking care of those patients better. I don't know. Uh, but they had, you know, pretty good sized group there. And uh, they were very convinced, including two patients that got better neurologically from giving them hormone resuscitation. So uh that that remains out there but everybody gets steroids and t4 after brain death that's standard opo practice so we have this list of donor management goals there are eight of them uh and they're just put the numbers in the box there's nothing magic about this it's put the numbers in the box and i wrote a paper a few years ago that looked at the more numbers in the box the more organs you got that probably makes good sense to everybody the more physiologically normal you are uh, the more organs that person is able uh, to donate. Um, one of my good friends, Darren Melanoski, got on this idea as well. And uh, when the DMGs were met, there was a much, much higher thoracic organ recovery. And you can look at the numbers on the left for heart and lung versus the numbers on the right where the DMGs were not met, the donor management goals were not met. And you can, you can see there's a, a tremendous improvement there. We do use the Vigileo, the flow track system, to resuscitate our donors. This is the algorithm that's been uh, published, which basically looks at a um, SVV uh, greater than or less than 13. And then you're either fluid responsive or you're not. If you're not fluid responsive, uh, I'm sorry, if you are fluid responsive, great, give volume until your SVV gets less than 13. If you're not fluid responsive, then it depends on what your SVI is, uh, your stroke volume index. If it's normal, i.e. the 40 to 50 range, you get pressors. If it's low, meaning your stroke volume index is low, that uh, how I explain that to the residents is, I mean, pump's not working, give them an inotrope. And if it's high, it means their volume overload to give them a diuretic. And so we try to use this to dial people in. We still do use CVPs and, and fluid balance as well. But uh, in hospitals where we can put one of these on somebody, I found it to be a very good way because these people are pretty tricky. It's very interesting when you become brain dead, how difficult it is to manage their volume status. Then something that's unique to uh, Kentucky that uh, was started by Dr. Garrison and uh, uh, championed by me for a while and then totally championed by Dr. Jason Smith, our very own CMO, is using direct peritoneal resuscitation. Without getting too far into the weeds, we put Delflex, which is peritoneal dialysis solution, into the abdomen through a little DPL catheter under their belly button. 
believe it or not, it is the hula hoop of resuscitation. Sugar water in the abdomen, you know, turns out because of its osmotic gradient, dilates the liver vasculature. So it increases portal venous flow. So that increases liver blood flow. Increasing liver blood flow drops all the pro-inflammatory cytokine production by the liver, which is bad for the lungs and the heart. Increasing the splanchnic blood flow non-pharmacologically offloads the heart. It's like nipride with sugar water. And so, uh, and we saw a huge increase. You can look there at the control and the DPR group from three to 3.7 organs transplanted uh, per donor just by putting in the DPR. And that's uh, our data on liver blood flow. This is from human patients. We've got approval to measure their liver blood flow using a, um, a, a dye technique uh, that's very commonly used and their liver blood flow goes up after you start it. And the red bars are DPR. So the amount of crystalloid that the coordinators have to give them to quote, resuscitate them goes down. So less fluid, that's good for the lungs and the heart. And the amount of vasopressors, even though initially was high at 12 hours, look at that, vasopressors almost disappeared at 12 hours by resuscitating them with DPR. We do this with trauma patients with open abdomens. Like I said, without getting too far down into the weeds of this technique, it's just unbelievable how you can go from three organs to 3.7 organs transplanted per donor, nearly all increases were in thoracic organs. You'd think, oh, you increase liver blood flow, so liver donation went up. Turns out liver donation is pretty good unless you have cirrhosis <laughs> or a fatty liver. So it didn't make the liver donation rate go up. It made the other things go up because the liver is responsible for so many pro-inflammatory cytokines. So new times, new regulations, right? CMS, they're the government. They're just here to help us. And so, you know, uh, the new metrics are looking at who is a donor. The light circle, you know, uh, is people we think might be potential donors, <laughs> but CMS says, no, 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 it's all of them, they're donors. And uh, uh, they've greatly determined who should be a donor. And let me just explain that to you. Uh, 75 years or old or older, and you died in a hospital, you're a donor. Period. Now, we did get him to say you have to die on a ventilator, uh, but they were hell bent on this being the definition. Now, if you die of multi system organ failure, probably not going to be a donor. <laughs> if, you, if you die of metastatic cancer, probably not going to be a donor. They didn't want to hear any of that. They, they said you're 75, you're on a vent, you died in a hospital, you're a donor. So that became the denominator for every organ procurement organization in the country. I'll tell you why that's important in a second. Who's transplanted? At least one organ transplanted has to be, that, that, that kind of makes sense for a numerator, although there used to be wiggle room that if you removed an organ with the intent to transplant it, and then like happened at, one of our very close hospitals, <laughs> two weeks ago, the surgeon drops the kidneys on the floor. Uh, then, uh, you know, you don't transplant the kidneys. So in the old days, we would have gotten credit for that. In the new days, too bad, so sad. No organ went in anybody. So, okay, I get that. All right. So there are some nuances to the denominator. It uses the CDC mortality multiple cause data which runs 18 months uh, to two years in the rear. Meaning this year I'm being graded on how many people died in 2021, all right? It uses the place of death instead of the place of residence. So that's good and bad, depending on if you're a tourism state or not. And if you're a place like us, it takes a lot of people from Southern Indiana uh, here, and they die here because we're the trauma hospital, because we're, you know, a trauma center on the border, right? 
we take we take a hit for all the Indiana people. Now, no one in this room has access to that database. What we have access to is the CDC Wonder database, which uses the place of residence, which is very inaccurate compared to the data they're going to use. So none of us even know what the denominator is until you get your letter from CMS that tells you if you're in the, the, the naughty club or not. And it uses all deaths as opposed to the wonder data only uses U.S. citizens. Now, I don't care which they use. I'm not here to argue if you died in a hospital, you died in a hospital, you can be a donor, whether you're an immigrant or a citizen. The problem is we don't have access to that data. So we don't know what that denominator is that we're continually being graded by. There's a lot of nuances to the numerator as well, <laughs> using the data, you know, for, um, uh, the numerator. We don't know if it's the date of death or the date of recovery. Uh, there's some nuances to the numerator about what is one organ transplanted. That's all 58 OPOs in the country looking at these metrics of their donation rate and their potential donors by the CMS definition. Once again, this is 2017 data because we haven't really seen the, the most latest data. We have seen the 2019 data, but that's what it looked like in 2017. So they created a flagging rule and you gotta be at the 75th percentile or above and they calculate the 95% confidence intervals based on that. So what does that mean? Well, that red dash line is, is the line, but then there's some wiggle room that I don't understand at all. So the blue dashed line is the real line. And so using that data evaluation in 2017, 31 of the 58 OPOs in America would have been decertified and our transplants uh, program in America would have collapsed immediately. <laughs> and so it's, it's the government, they're only here to help us. And so <laughs> if you look, we're red, and this is not a political map. <laughs> red is dead. We're one of the 31, and you can see who else falls into that category. Use this, the, the 2017 look. This is the transplant rate. 36 of 58 OPOs in transplant programs failed uh, because they didn't meet the metric for the transplant rate. You can see we're red and dead there, too. Uh, so it's, it is very interesting. You know, and then look at Florida. Florida has three OPOs, one, two, three, four OPOs, I'm sorry. How is it, you know, that the one that includes Daytona Beach is fine and the other ones are not? How are Florida citizens outside of Miami that heterogeneous, you know, um, but that that's what it is. So what does it all mean? We don't really know what it all means. Uh, no one knows for sure who they'll close in 2026, 2025, 2025. No one knows who exactly they'll, they'll close. The whole idea was to improve the system. There have been exponential increases in DCD donors. I've showed you that. And a lot of use of marginal organs, a lot of enhanced allocation models and and uh, strategies. It's basically my opinion and, and those of many that, that the whole goal here is not be the bottom five. Because I think if you're in the bottom five, you're a real risk. And what that means is they, they don't close you, but they allow you to be hostily taken over by somebody in the top group. So they figure, well, you must be managing your, your OPO incorrectly. And so we'll let one of the good blue guys take you over. And of course, that would cause unbelievable disruptions to our system, but they're going to close some. Why do we have 58 OPOs in 50 states? Nobody knows. Why are there four in Ohio and four in Florida? Nobody knows. There's only one in Kentucky. There are two in Tennessee. Yeah, if you looked at that map, you would have saw a little red dot in Memphis. Memphis is its own organ procurement organization, and the rest of Tennessee falls under Tennessee Donor Services out of Nashville. Why is that? It makes no sense to anybody. They're going to close some. We've moved dramatically since 2017, so we're not we're not red and dead. Uh, but uh, you know, it is it has got everybody looking. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes on the future, and then we'll be done. 
So there's a lot of things that are enhancing in, in uh, organ do, uh, donation. And one of the first things that uh, I recognized when I became the medical director was we had a transportation problem. And so we started using UPS immediately and uh, they're actually delivering things around the world by drone. Now we're not dropping your liver or your kidney off by drone just yet, but they do deliver blood products and things all across uh, the world in, in hostile areas with uh, drone technology for safety. I will tell you, we have made a thousand moves with UPS, a thousand. Now that only works with Louisville because this is their hub, but it boy, did it work for CODA. Um, pumping, uh, we're all about pumping organs. Woohoo! You know, this whole idea of normothermic regional perfusion, everybody's getting into this where you essentially occlude the cerebral vasculature. And after a DCD donor passes, you start recirculating the blood. And uh, it makes a big difference with all of the organs. Uh, this is a heart in the box that we did. Is that pumping for you? That's one we did right here at U of L. Take the heart out put it on the pump, give it a little blood, and look at that. It just starts beating again like it's sitting in your chest. It's so happy. This is increasing the storage time on hearts, which is normally about a six to eight hour kind of thing. There are no hearts from Kentucky going to California. If you live in Hawaii and you need a heart, I, my recommendation would be you move to California because uh, you're never going to get one because of airplanes. And so this is gonna increase uh, time uh, for storage. Here's the lung in the uh, box model uh, using the ex vivo system. We've got one of these at Jewish hospital. You, you can bronch them and look at their anatomy. You can give some interventions. You can treat them with antibiotics. There's all kinds of stuff you can do to improve lung performance. Now that's, uh, I think, should be obvious to everyone, medical and non-medical. Uh, that's 30 minutes after cardiac arrest, the way we usually do liver recovery for DCD donors, and that's 30 minutes after cardiac arrest in someone who's received normothermic regional perfusion. Look at the color of the liver. Uh, so you can figure out right away that, that uh, those livers are going to look better. So in the past, everybody got their organ put in a cold box and shipped somewhere. In the present, we're doing some NRP and some cold perfusion. There are a few places where you can send your organ to a rehab center and they'll, they'll put it in their box and try to make it better. They got physical therapists there for the liver and for the kidneys and, you know, they, uh, and then they can be uh, sent out to other places for transplant. The future is going to be where there are some bio assessments and there are things that are done in that intervention to make those organs better. And, and that uh, right now it's just pumping the organ to get it to increase its lifespan in storage. But there are, are things on the horizon to make those uh, organs that are marginal suitable for transplantation during the so-called rehabilitation phase. So why be so aggressive? You know, it's, every donor could save seven of their lives. You know, our, our, our conversion rates in the, in the 80s to 90s depend on when it's measured and, and what. Uh, but I think it's I think it's ethically important uh, to offer this to our patients because most people uh, say yes. Over 65 percent of Kentuckians have already registered on the driver's license thing. So it's important. They've already stated their wishes. Look at all the crazy things we do to patients without hard data. We have hard data, 65% or more people want to be a donor, period. You know, our consent rates in the 80s or 90s, so you, you know, and so this is what people want to do. It's an end of life decision. I never tell anybody what funeral home to choose. And I never tell them what color of suit to put Papa in. But so this is another end of life decision for families. And so we just ask that we preserve the opportunity. Uh, we're all about going green and recycling. <laughs> And so uh, please sign your driver's license. We'd love to have your organs when you're done with them. And uh, so um, Dr. Williams told me we'd do a 60 second wrap up at the end. So do that on film. oh, we do that on film. For the internet. Okay. When do I do that? Not now. That'd be great. All right. I'll, I'll do some questions and answers. Sorry, we're running right up against time.
Yes, sir. In the I think one of the things I love about you, though, is that we care about uh, our parents' disparities and that we are actively fighting against them. So, one of the things that popped in my mind here is that, you know, I don't know if you know, but I see it in the news all the time, actually. And it's, it's always been talked about is that the wealthy are allowed to sign up for multiple um, geographic areas of residency. My question is, do we still allow that to happen? But what is it a clear disparity in healthcare that we allow this to happen? And if we allow it to happen still, what do you allow the to try to get it? Well, it's legal. So there's nothing that we're doing to try and, and prevent that. So that's all on the transplant center side. If someone presents themselves to your transplant center and they agree to your terms, which is to be available in some time frame when they, quote, get the call, then, you know, people will will sign up in, in different centers, you know, uh, for that. It, it is absolutely legal. And I do understand that that does, you know, affect you know, the wealthy more than the non-wealthy. I don't think it's done that often. No one is, quote, buying an organ. But someone who lived in Lexington might get themselves listed in Lexington and in Cincinnati, you know. Uh, but, you know, you have to agree to go to all those appointments. You have to agree to be available. If you're not available when the call comes, then they, they skip you and move on. But people are, there are people who are still listed at multiple transplant uh, centers. On the healthcare disparity side, on the other end, something I have more control over is who we go after for organs and education we do in the community. We have a whole division in CODA that's you know tagged at getting to the community. Now, community comes in different forms other than just race and gender. It also comes in age. So, you know, we have a big social media presence because that's what the young people are looking at. We still have a high school program. We want high school kids to think this is good and sign up. Obviously, we have a program with the churches and particularly with the non, what's the word I want to use, the historically black churches or churches of color. We have, we have people who look like them, who work with them in the community. Eastern Kentucky, hard nut to crack. And so that's a big disparity there. So we work with those folks to try and encourage them to sign up uh, for donation and hoping that, you know, people will see this is a good thing and that the way to saturate the system so that no one who needs an organ is denied an organ is for there to be plenty of organs available for everyone. Uh, but, you, you know, it's a good question. Uh, I, I, I think the system is, is overall pretty fair and looks out for everyone, but there's always bias built into a system, right? If you don't have a car and you can't drive, it's hard for you to make it to your doctor's appointments. And there are systems in place to, to help get you transportation, but a, as you and I both know, that those can be challenging. Here in Louisville, it's not as big a deal. It's a big deal in Eastern Kentucky, big deal in Eastern Kentucky, just getting to the doctor. We have transplant clinics around the state to try and get people in. Both universities do have outside transplant centers. So they have satellite clinics that they'll run once a month. I think those are all good things to, to reach out to the to the community. Steve. Um, you said about the COVID management experience for time to time. I think of that as a really good thing. Obviously, the last several days. How important is it that the team that may get in the moment of no one knows the answer to that question. Um, a lot of times we'll stop tube feeds after someone is uh, uh, declared brain dead. Uh, we won't uh, stop anything if it's going to be a DCD donor. They're still a living patient. They're full treatment right till family decides to withdraw uh, care. We do have to be careful with nutrition because a lot of our patients are on pressors. And so there is the concern about, you know, shifting blood flow and intestinal ischemia. It's not... Uh, Typically, we try to get it down to a day, to a 24-hour uh, period. But as you know and I know, there could be days ahead of time where nobody was doing anything. Our biggest problem is physicians ignoring the patient because they think care is futile. That is our biggest problem. Not any of these other things. Not getting past socioeconomic barriers, not getting past language barriers, 
not get, you know, we'll go get permission for mama who is in prison, you know, about their son, you know, who uh, may be becoming a donor, you know, and you send some of these nice little ladies from Coda over to the jail to check in and talk to somebody. That's pretty interesting, but we do that. Our biggest problem is ICU doctors and nurses seeing a patient out in the community and saying care is futile and doing nothing, not resuscitating them, not doing anything. And so the biggest yield of organs is the more donor management goals that are met when CODA is referred to the bedside. So if I go to the bedside and the donor looks good, that's the biggest organ yield for that person. The next biggest yield is at time of recovery. So if in that donor management period, CODA was able to take a creatinine from two and a half and make it normal because we just gave them IV fluids, then, you know, donation, our number of organs uh, goes up. And don't think you know who's a bad donor. When I started this business, hepatitis C, you were a bad donor. Now they're great donors. Why? Harvoni or any of the other concoctions. So we give hepatitis C positive organs to hepatitis C negative patients all the time. There's a 94% chance that you will not uh, transmit the disease. If you're waiting on a heart, let me tell you, you'll take a hepatitis C positive heart, you know. Uh, and if you've been going to, to dialysis three times a week and it's killing your lifestyle, you'll take hepatitis C positive kidney. You sure will every time. 94% chance you're not going to transmit the disease. Oh, yeah. You know, you hit the lottery. So, I just had two kidneys transplanted three weeks ago. The terminal creatinine was 8.5. Young donor had not received a lot of health care in the ICU before we went there. And we thought, okay, we can screw around for hours and try to flood this donor with fluids, or we can just go to the OR and retrieve these kidneys, which we did put them on our pump, which we put every kidney on the pump, biopsied them, and Arizona took one and Maryland took the other, who are notoriously the two most aggressive kidney transplant centers in America for one reason or another, and both are functioning. No one would have ever thought someone whose creatinine was eight, now it was a young donor, you know, but eight, not two and a half, eight. <laughs> and so never think that's a bad organ because there are a lot of things that have changed. The good question about nutrition, no one knows the answer to that. Yes, sir. So interestingly enough, uh, I was going to ask this question about the disparities and I have just seen the numbers uh, that 18.7% of African Americans in the United States, this came out from NIH just three weeks ago, uh, were donors, and it was nearly twice that in whites. And then you realize those are terrible numbers, regardless of race. And so I'm glad to hear that you're really working on the the healthcare disparity uh, and trying to get to the African American population to try to not be half of a bad number. But we have to fix the bad number. Right. So as you know, there's still a lot of mistrust, and you go to hospitals, and if you're African American, most of the healthcare staff probably does not look like you. And so there is still that mistrust. Oh, they're not going to take care of Uncle Joe because they just want his organs. We have to dispel all those myths. In fact, people who are potential donors get better care because <laughs> everybody's paying attention to all those numbers. <laughs> they actually get better care once, you know, someone gets involved, you know, that, that's trying to, to do, you know, better for the patient. Um, South Carolina notoriously had the highest rate of African American consent for donation, and it's and I trained there, and it's it's because everybody knew someone who needed a kidney, because it was endemic in the population. So it is interesting that it's not a rule you can apply everywhere. In South Carolina, everybody knew somebody who needed a kidney, so those people were just happy as clams to, you know, donate because they knew they had a family member or they knew someone. So it is about getting that message, I think, out there. And, and you know, I think we're probably pretty good at CODA with Hispanics and with, uh, with African-American population. But as our 
population in Kentucky changes, we we got to change a little bit too. There are a lot more immigrants from across the pond, so to speak, and that presents new challenges uh, for us. Definitely want to thank you. No, my pleasure. And, um, I know we went a little over time, but this is just fascinating. All right, so thank you.